I'll talk a bit about the, what I call the geopolitics of deception. What I want to say about geopolitics is that if we try to make sense of the world today, which is not easy at all, we need to think about geography, we need to think about history, we need to think about culture. When we talk about deception, I think straight away, instead of showing any victimhood, I think we are accomplices in deception and in disinformation and misinformation. We aren't simply victims. We participate in it. If it happens, it's because we are participating in it. It's because we want it. And uh, I want to ask the question, why do we want to be deceived? Why do we need to be deceived? I also think that it has always happened. Even if we take the first mythical story of the Bible and the story of the tree of knowledge, it's actually the tree of misinformation and disinformation. <laughs> and the snake is telling Eve, you know, if you eat from its forbidden fruit, you will become like God. I don't think it's... I don't agree with the definition that you will become wise. I think there the temptation was to become like God. And to become like God is the other form of disinformation and misinformation that I am so comfortable in my worldview that I create the world in my image. I am God. I will create the world in my image. I will accept only as facts and as evidence what fits within my worldview and the other facts and uh, other evidence is all fake news. That's all interpretations. That is also misinformation and disinformation, which we create ourselves. I think um, good old Machiavelli put it very bluntly and I think brilliantly when he said, one who deceives, one who deceives will always find those who allow themselves to be deceived. And that is why I speak strongly against our role in being deceived and not simply playing the victims. We are accomplices, we are partners. You have the sender of information, you have the information itself, and as receivers, we process the information that we receive. And we will allow ourselves to be deceived if we want to be deceived. And uh, I think it's good to give some, some examples, which obviously we don't have enough time to go into, but let's take an issue that is going on right now, which I think is very important. And uh, I think we're living the most dangerous moment in history, in, in human history, where nuclear war is more possible. Not only is it more possible, we are actually saying that it is possible to have nuclear war and to survive it. The amount of effort that there is going on to erode and destroy the nuclear taboo is amazing. You read serious magazines like Forbes that give you practical tips on how to survive nuclear war. You know, you wash your face very often, you face downwards, if there is radiation, don't go out. Doesn't tell you a lot what to do if you happen to be in the street when radiation hits you. But in that case, they tell you, lie down and put your head like this, and you'll be okay. In the same article, it talks about the utter devastation that nuclear war uh, creates. The manufacturers of nuclear shelters are making a roaring trade at the moment in the States and even in countries in Europe. If you have one third of a million dollars to spare, or one quarter, obviously it depends on the level and standards that you have, you can buy your own private nuclear shelter to survive this nuclear war. Governments have now for practically 40 years or more given up on trying to create nuclear shelters to save the public because they know that a nuclear war is terrible. At the beginning of this year, we had a very promising beginning. 
when the five major nuclear powers said a war, a nuclear war, cannot be won and must not be fought. But last year, they spent $82 billion modernizing their nuclear arsenal. At the same time, talk has started that we can use low-yield tactical nuclear weapons in the battlefield and it will be okay. So this erosion of, of the nuclear taboo is so strong. And should we accept it? Should we be deceived by this? No need to tell you that during last year, while there was economic hardship and companies were suffering and tourism, manufacturing, the best performing companies were the, those of the military-industrial complex, producing also nuclear arms. The stocks and shares went up, and we're still in a very shameful position when senators and Congress people, on both Democrats and Republicans, have stocks and shares in these companies. There is no conflict of interest legislation to regulate them. They sit on committees where they decide foreign policy. They don't declare that they have that interest. And they see their stocks and shares going up while, you know, putting the whole world at, at risk. At the same time, these companies pump millions of dollars into think tanks very prestigious think tanks talking about international affairs and foreign policy. These are not necessarily tell us what to think, but they do tell us what to think about. And I think the most formidable, dangerous form of disinformation and misinformation is not when it touches us directly. It's how it frames the narrative. And a lot of the times the think tanks are telling us, I repeat, not what to think, but what to think about. And they don't tell us to think about the escalation that is going on of, of nuclear weapons. And this is why we need to ask the question that Herman asked. I would put it in a more direct manner uh, for all type of information, not just news. Where are, we going, where are we getting our information from? Who are the sources? We are on the risk and it's inevitable that the most powerful nations in the world produce most of the information that we consume. So we need to ask, where are, you know, what kind of information are we getting? Whose information are we getting? Because once, once, someone else is framing our information, and telling us what to think about, they are actually doing the thinking for us. Once they are thinking for us, whether there is a mixture of falsehood and truths in it, that becomes misinformation and disinformation. We need, we need to create, not to be like gods, not to create the world in our image, but we need to become autonomous and create the information be skeptical, doubt. We need doubt. We don't need acts of faith. We don't need certainty. It's very uncomfortable. If we do not want to be misinformed and disinformed, it's very uncomfortable. Because the best way to live is to live in our comfort zone. Whereas if we live in our comfort zone, we've had it. We need to make ourselves resilient. I think it has become the most important quality that we should have. To move from our comfort zones into growth zones. And growth zones bring with them uncertainty, bring with them doubt, bring with them definitely not black and white. And I think, and I think I'll, I'll end on this note, is we, I think, all of us, have lost, whether we like it or not, we have lost our comfort zones. I think we are living, especially, definitely my generation, but I think even in your case, those younger, I might be the, older, the oldest person here. I think we have become what I would call existential nomads. We live wandering in the wilderness, disoriented. We have lost our points of reference. 
Now, the temptation when that happens is to be nostalgic. And that is why you have, that is why you have the, I think, populism, and that is why you have people who are saying, don't move forward, don't go into growth zones. Look for the comfort of the past, when people were not meeting each other, when we, didn't, when we were not having diversity, was, what is this rubbish about diversity and about multiculturalism? Let's have walls, let's have fences, let's have certainty, let's go back to the past. It's the, it's the politics of nostalgia, which is very powerful. Because once you are disoriented, once you've, le you've lost your bearings and your points of reference, what do you do? Either try to, and I know, I know it, it's useless, either try to find these certainties in the past, which, is not, which you cannot recreate, and which has never been golden, so it's not paradise lost. You know, it's not para you're not trying to regain paradise lost. But, but I think that the politics of nostalgia, and I think that at the moment, uh, we don't have time to go into this, I think the most dominant geopolitical movement that is going on is the nostalgia of empires in different ways. And not just the major powers, not just the Americans. I think they are trying to keep their hegemony that they want to be, you know, number one and have a unipolar world. But even those who want a multipolar world want to have their own empires as well. I mean, Putin's war in, in Ukraine is an imperial, is an imperial war. Thankfully, and for this, I'm very happy, and the, that the world is so turbulent, that countries are going to make it more difficult for those who want to create empires to recreate those empires. But this brings more turbulence with it. This brings more rough seas. But we have to be ready to navigate these rough seas where we have no maps. <laughs>